new chapter, all right, new chapter, chapter 13, particle kinetics. Now we're talking about forces, right? And we're kind of using those forces to get the motion. You all realize that the, all the problems we've done, the test, I just told you, hey, the velocity is 0.05 T squared. We didn't derive it. We didn't, we were just given that. Now we're going to look at all the forces and then we'll figure out, oh, that leads to a, an acceleration of, you know, 5T or something. That leads to, a, if we're lucky, that leads to a constant acceleration of 2 meters per second squared. So then you can use constant acceleration equations. So we are adding on to everything we've been doing. Don't forget about uh, what we had been doing for uh, the last um, the last test. All right, so a, a good definition for kinetics. Study of relations between unbalanced forces, unbalanced forces, and the resulting changes in motion. The resulting changes in motion. All right, we, we kind of gave a definition of Newton's second law as some of the forces equals mass times acceleration. This is a vector equation that force is a vector, right? It has, it has direction. That acceleration is, is a vector. It has direction. So really, it is three equations. Y'all know how I like to separate uh, all these directions and these equations. Three equations in one, if we're, if we're in three dimensions. Not a lot of times, we're in two dimensions. It's two equations. Some of the forces equals mass times acceleration. Some of the forces equals mass times acceleration. Let's don't get back into the habit of sometimes my pencil will do this on its own. I'm writing all the forces and then I write equals zero because I've been trained statics and mechanics. Everything's equal to zero. Not this class, right? Try in this class, we're writing out all those forces like we've been doing, but we're going to write equals ma and then think what is the a. Sometimes it will be zero. Absolutely. You know, sometimes it will be zero, but let's write ma and then set it to zero if it's equal to zero, or leave it as a if it has a, if it has acceleration. Uh, now, take, th this equation is not really true. You know that the sum of the force is not really equal to mass times acceleration. Uh, it's really equal to the change in momentum, the derivative. It's the time rate of change in momentum. Forces lead to change in momentum. Forces change momentum. This MV is momentum right here. Uh, and so when you take a derivative of two things that are multiplied together, uh, then you take a derivative of the first times the second plus uh, the first times the derivative of the second. So it, it's actually only equal to mass times acceleration if this term is zero. So if mass is constant, then this term is zero. And then yes, some of the force equals mass times acceleration, right? This is acceleration. All right. So in other classes, especially your aero majors in the youth, or if you look at fluids, control volumes where, you know, gases, anything is, is leaving your control volume, uh, then you can't, some of the forces equals mass times acceleration anymore. You have, you have that dm dt term. Uh, but if mass is constant, that term is zero, and some of the forces equals mass times acceleration. Uh, so free body diagrams, real quickly. I expect you to be able to handle uh, springs. Let's remind you of springs, right? Force in a spring is k delta x. Uh, ropes, cables, normal force. If you've got two things that are touching each other, then you've got the normal force of one on the other, the normal force of one on the other. You might have trouble with that angle. You know, the normal force is perpendicular to the surface. Um, so I expect you to understand and know all those. I'm going to talk about friction in just a, uh, just a minute. Uh, we'll really hit on friction today. Uh, I like you to make your free body diagram self-sufficient. Make your free body diagram self-sufficient, right? It needs to include the axes, the, all the forces, all the angles, all the dimensions, anything that you, um, anything in the problem statement, draw it on your free body diagram so that you're just, now you're just looking at your free body diagram. 
you don't have to go back to the book. You don't have to go back to the figure that they gave you. You can just look at your free body diagram uh, to solve uh, for, for what you need. Um, if you need some steps for our problem solving, step one, if you're not sure, I think it's good to organize your thoughts. Just write a given and find solution. Just, just rewrite what you're given um, and then write what you're trying to find. <laughs> For your homework, you can start with your free body diagram in your given section, right? You can take that whole problem statement in the book and inside your given for your homework, that's where I want you to draw your free body diagram and include all the forces, make it self-sufficient like, like your homework needs to be. Uh, so you can start with the free body diagram in the given section. Uh, but anyway, sketching that free body diagram uh, is, is important. And define your axes. Define your axes right here. And then sum the forces in X equals mass times acceleration in X. Sum the forces in Y. Mass times acceleration in Y. If you're in 3D, sum the forces in the other direction. Mass times acceleration in that direction. So use these equations. These are our equilibrium equations. Well, they're equations. I, I still call them equilibrium equations, even though we are in dynamics. Um, they're really our equations of motion. I use these equations to solve for, um, I'll just say, say to solve for unknowns. Uh, many times we're, sol we're using those equations to solve for acceleration, but sometimes we'll be given acceleration and we can, so then we can solve for maybe an unknown force or something. All right, and then maybe once we have the acceleration, then we're still doing all this from chapter, what was it, 12, right? We might take an integral, derivatives, constant acceleration equations when the acceleration is constant, right? I know y'all aren't gonna use constant acceleration equations when you shouldn't anymore, right? Okay, uh, so there's kind of an overview for these problems. I wanna talk about friction because we don't do this as much in statics or our other classes. <laughs> and because I think there are some misconceptions about friction. All right, here, I was always thought or always told that force friction between two solid surfaces, I was always told it opposes motion. Yeah, yeah, most of the time. But do you know that sometimes, even if there is no motion, there can still be friction. I think y'all kind of know that. And so we need to really say it, it opposes motion or impending motion, right? The motion that it feels like it's wanting to go. All right. And technically, it opposes the relative motion of the two objects, the relative motion between the two objects. Um, so nine times out of 10, yes, friction opposes the motion, but sometimes it's not moving, so we need to say impending motion. And then sometimes, especially when the something underneath is kind of slipping out from, from under uh, something, then you might be going to the left and friction is to the left uh, because the relative motion uh, is to the right. All right, so just think about the easiest scenario we can have. A box with the force P uh, pushing on it right here. So let's draw a free body diagram of this box. I think we can do this in seven minutes. Um, the weight right there, the normal force, I don't know how you were taught normal force. I, I put the normal force up there. It's really, the ground is pushing up on the block. Right, the ground is pushing up on the block. And so if I was to push to the right on this box, I would have a force of friction pushing to the left. If I give it a small force P, what happens if I don't push it very hard at all? It doesn't move, right? So at very small forces, if it doesn't move, then some of the forces in the X direction would, would add up to zero. P is counteracted by the force of friction. They add up to zero. P is equal to the force of friction. 
at small um, at small forces. So if we were to plot our P versus force of friction, you know, a little bit larger P, if it's still not moving, then the force of friction is, it's a one-to-one -one ratio here. Uh, and so what happens is if we get larger and larger forces P that we're applying, the force of friction just counteracts it until it starts moving and then I don't know if y'all have known this or have seen this. Once it starts moving, I can force, I can push it with a larger and larger and larger force. The force of friction stays constant. All right. And it stays constant at this value right here. This value is mu k times n. So if the object is slipping, where are we on the diagram? We're at that region of the diagram, correct? You know, if the object has started slipping, right, this box has started slipping, um, we're in that region. And so the force of friction, it really is a constant mu k times n. So uh, if the object is slipping, force of friction is mu k times n. n is a normal force between the two objects. And mu k is the kinetic coefficient, kinetic coefficient of friction. And that coefficient will just depend on the two different materials. You know, if it's two smooth materials, then it might have a very low coefficient of friction. Or two, uh, like rubber and asphalt could be 0.9, or, but just whatever the two objects are, um, you'll be given the kinetic coefficient of friction. Okay. Now, here's my misconception. I used to think that if it was slipping, I would set the force of friction of mu k times n. And if it was not slipping, I would set the force of friction of mu s times n. But that's not, that's not true. That's not what we're going to do. Right? If it is not slipping, what is the force of friction? If it is not slipping, it is somewhere on that line. What is the force of friction? Well, it, it, could, it could be a number of different values. It could be anything from zero up to that maximum point. So this is what I do. If it is not slipping, then I, I, just, I just set force of friction equal to FF. And, and I'm, I'll, I'll try to solve for that, right? Because it could be anywhere from zero up to the maximum. What is the maximum? Let's talk about this maximum point. This maximum point right there, that's the mu s times n. So listen, only plug in mu s n if you know it's at that maximum point. What's that maximum point? Well, that would be the point where this just begins to start slipping. Or I, let me rephrase that. There's another way to put that. That's the maximum force that I can push before it starts slipping. You know, you, we can phrase it a few different ways, um, but generally, if, if it is on the verge of slipping, um, if we're trying to find the extreme case, like if I have, if, I, if this was on a, an incline and I was trying to find the maximum incline the maximum angle before it starts slipping you know so if it's if it's like a maximum a minimum uh i think you'll be able to recognize but if it is this case then yes set the force of friction to mu s times n generally mu s is a little bit larger than mu k it takes a little bit of force for it to overcome that initial um, force of friction to get it to start slipping. It's almost like this has kind of settled into the grooves, just microscopic, it's kind of settled into the grooves of the surface. So it takes a little bit to get it out of the grooves and, and get it going, but once it's kind of sliding on top of the grooves, the mu k is a little bit uh, smaller right there. This page may be the most important page in the whole notes and maybe the most you know some of y'all have trouble with the most mistakes 
but just let's try to make it simple. If it's slipping, for its friction, U K times in. If it is on the verge of slipping, or if it's the extreme value, what's the minimum force that I need to make to just barely make it start going? Then I would set force friction to mu s times n. But if it is not slipping, then just set force friction to ff. That is an unknown. It's almost like you're trading one unknown for another. Real quickly, if I know it's not slipping, then I know that the acceleration is zero, right? So for this pink situation, I know the acceleration is zero. Um, and so <laughs> I have enough equations where I can solve for force of friction right there. Um, for the blue scenario, you also know that it is not slipping just yet, right? For the blue scenario, the maximum, you know it's not slipping just yet. All right, important, important part in our notes, okay? So put that in your head. All right, we're, we're, we're done. We're good for today.